Like I said, my name is Pastor Noel O'War, and uh, I welcome you to Powerhouse Christian Church. In this church, we are about Jesus. We're a church that meets in two locations, one church in two locations, and so Wyckoff, uh, I want you to give a round of welcome to our Bridgewater campus who are joining us via live stream. Christian Bridgewater, you're welcome right now. We praise God for you. Amen. <clears throat> Today we begin a new series, our Easter series, titled Unashamed. And we're going to start from the book of Genesis, the book of the beginnings. I recently read an article in the New York Times. This article by Dave Brooks describes the American culture as a shame culture. The article argues that the omnipresence of social media has created a new sort of shame culture. The world of Facebook, Instagram, and the rest of our social media is a world of constant display and observation. When you put something on social media, it goes public the whole world can access and see. So people are in constant display and observation. And with this comes the desire to be embraced and praised by the community that are seeing what we have displayed. And this, this desire is so intense. And you know what? People dread being exiled and condemned when they put whatever they put out there. Moral life is not built on the continuum of right or wrong. It is built on the continuum of inclusion and exclusion. Everybody is perpetually insecure in a moral system based on inclusion and exclusion. And by inclusion and exclusion, I mean um, you, you feel included when you have so many likes on your page, there's a feeling of, you know, I'm included, I belong, I'm loved. Or excluded when there are no likes. Or, worse still, there are comments that might put you down. And with that comes shame. The people of this generation are constantly struggling to find their identity, their security in and through the social media. This is a shame culture. This article continues to say that in an era of omnipresence social media, it is probably important to discover and name your own personal true north. You need to name your vision of an ultimate good instead of waiting and looking to and depending on others to define you and name you. Most of us are living under the oppressive umbrella of shame. Now let me just quickly define what shame is. <clears throat> shame is the feeling and the thought that we are somehow wrong, defective, inadequate, not good enough, or not strong enough. You're being told every day by circumstances and situations and people and things and probably history, the past that has happened in your life, that that, that you're, not, you're not good enough, you're inadequate, you're defective, you're not strong enough. When you feel shame, you feel like your whole self is wrong, that everything about you is wrong. Now, let, shame and guilt are different. Let's not confuse shame and guilt. When you feel guilty, you're making a judgment that something you have done is wrong. 
But when you feel shame, you feel like the whole of you is wrong. See, you'd rather be guilty than shame. If you're to given shame and guilt, you probably should choose guilt, though none of them is attractive at all. I grew up feeling shame. Grew up in extreme poverty. In a little town in Kenya. Most times we didn't have enough food for my family. We didn't have enough clothes. I went to school with very torn clothes and no shoes. And close to the place where we lived, there, were, there was a very rich neighborhood. We considered them rich because they drove, to, they drove their kids to school. They, went, they, they had family vacations. They ate foods that I had never seen before. And they spoke English with a different accent. But while still, they looked down on us. We were the kids who smelled bad, who looked bad, who went to the lowly schools. And we never spoke English. And so I remember questioning life and asking, why them? Why, are they, why do they seem and look so privileged? Something must be wrong with us. I chose wrong parents. I wish I had different sets of parents. No, these ones who have led us to this poor livelihood. Being teased every day that you, you don't have shoes, you don't have food, you, you, you have a, a weird accent. We had a weird accent because we lived in the slum and we spoke very, very mixed English with all kinds of things in it. I still do that up to today. I've not been delivered from it. Right now, I'm not really looking for that deliverance. I, I actually really love it. So don't try to deliver me from my accent. Okay? You should be delivered from wanting to deliver me. From anyway, that's for another day. So I experienced a lot of shame. And shame is, is this thing that has followed me most of my life. Because other than growing, being poor, there was also a lot of physical abuse that we experienced from my, my teachers in school who made us feel like we're stupid and we don't know, we don't have the intelligence to thrive like the other kids. Have you ever felt shame before? Or are you living under the shadow of shame right now? But why are we talking about shame? Why aren't we talking about guilt or any other thing? Let's look at Genesis. I'll first read, I'll first read chapter 2, and then I'll go back to chapter 1. All right? I'll read chapter 2 from verse 7, Genesis chapter 2, verse 7, and then I'll read verse 25. Genesis chapter 2, verse 7 says this, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostril the breath of life, and the man became a living being. Verse 25. Adam and his wife were both naked. I think I just got some of, I got your attention. Like, wow, naked. Is that in the Bible? That the Bible talks about being naked? Adam and his wife were both naked, and they felt no shame. Why shame? Why doesn't it say they felt no fear? Why doesn't it say they felt no guilt? Because shame is this thing, like I said earlier, that would make you re feel like everything is wrong with you. That everything you've tried is wrong. That your whole being is wrong. And if, this, if the enemy succeeds to put shame on you, he has succeeded in destroying your 
very being who you are. That's why the Bible is careful to say that there was a time in history when humanity did not experience shame. There was a time in history when humanity was unashamed. Next week we'll read in chapter 3 to see how shame came to earth and the, the effect and the impact of shame. And we'll even go further in this series to let you and I know that we can be unashamed. That we can truly embrace being unashamed. But today I want us to look at how, what is it about Adam and Eve that helped them to live without shame? What are some of the things that we learn? And if we could begin to grapple with some of those things that we learn from the life of Adam and Eve in chapter 1 and chapter 2 of Genesis will help us to begin to confront any shame that is in our lives. Amen? So, Genesis chapter 1. I'm reading from verse 26. This is the creation story. We are on the sixth day of creation. God has created the heavens and the earth. He's created the stars, the moon. He's created the sea and all the creatures of the sea, the birds of the air. And in verse 26, it says, Then God said, Let us make mankind in our image in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals and over all the creatures that move along the ground. Verse 27, So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them, male and female. He created them. Verse 28, God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea, and the birds in the air, and over every living creature that moves on the ground. When you read the story of Adam and Eve and their creation, there are things that you see about how God created humanity and and how different that was from how he created everything else. You and I were created, we are unique creations. You and I are unique creatures of God. And you'll see our uniqueness in three areas. In value, in purpose, and significance. Look at how unique humanity was created. It says in in chapter 2 of verse 7, Then the Lord God formed a man from the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life. And the man became a living being. It says that, you know, God, in day one, God spoke. Let there be light, and it was. Day two, God spoke, let there be. Day three, God spoke, let there be. Day four, God spoke, let there be. Day five, God spoke, let there be. Day six, God spoke, let there be. But in the middle of day six, God had a meeting. God had a meeting himself and said, we we need to make some special creation. This creation will not just say, let there be. We We need to make someone very, very special. So, so they came up with a strategy that we're going to go and get some clay. As a, how many of you have played with Play-Doh? Raising my kids, Play-Doh was, uh, you know, we played with Play-Doh like every day. You know, trying to mold. God had Play-Doh. Brought Play-Doh and started molding and forming and shaping.
No other creature was created that way. You are molded and formed and shaped by God. The way you look is a piece of art by the greatest artist ever. If you want to see the creativity of God, come on. Look at the mountains. Look at the sea, the heavens and the earth. Look at the moon when it's rising. Come on, ex- enjoy the snow. But now you don't want to talk about snow. We are ex- beginning to, to, to see the spring come, right? Though I was told that there might be some snow hitting someday, but i like, no, uh, depart from me. That's like from the devil. I was told that maybe Friday there might be something. I don't know. But right now, I just want spring like yesterday. It was awesome. I was like, I don't want to be inside the house. I want to be outside. God created all of that by his powerful word. But when it came to you and me, he took his time. He said, I'm going to mold these human beings. I'm going to mold them uniquely. It says that <clears throat> when God had formed and molded you and I, Adam and Eve, he says he breathed the breath of life in them. We don't see that for every, any creature, any other creature but human beings, that God breathed the breath of life in them. What does that mean? The breath of life is a spirit that gives you life. Job 32 verse 8 says, but it is the spirit in a person, the breath of the Almighty that gives them understanding. That through that breath of life, it does not only give you the breath to, to, to breathe, but it gives you spiritual understanding that you're able to understand things. Other animals don't have that kind of understanding. You do have understanding. You're able to, to comprehend and make decisions and, uh, and, and choices. You're able to comprehend God. You have a spiritual understanding to know who God is and who is not God. A spiritual understanding to relate to God. You read the story of Adam and Eve, it says that God used to go to the garden in the cool of the day and have a relationship and conversations with with Adam and Eve and spend time with them because Adam and Eve had in them the breath of life, the spiritual understanding, to be able to carry out a conversation with God and have a relationship. You are so unique that because you are able to have a relationship with God, that the, the, the powerful God can sit down with you and I and connect and talk and have a meal together. That Jesus can sit with you at Starbucks and share coffee with you. Do you know that that's true? Revelation 3.20, here I stand at the door and knock at the door of your heart. If anyone opens the door, I'll come in and sit with him and, and eat with him and he with me. Like, that's really in the Bible. It is uh, the, spirit, the, the spiritual understanding that God's given you and I that helps us to relate with God. You're unique. What else does this breath of life do? Proverbs 20, 27. The human spirit is the lamb of God that sheds light on one innermost being. You can call that conscience. So you're created not just with a spiritual understanding, but with conscience. You're able to Distinguish right and wrong. You're unique. And in this uniqueness, <clears throat> I 
We, are, we learn that we are unique because, one, we are of value. The passage we read in verse 20, <clears throat> chapter 1, verse 26. Chapter 1, verse 26 says that um, we are, let us make man, mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the earth. What does it mean to be made in God's image, God's likeness? Back in the day, the kings of the earth would build statues in their dominion, statues that were images of them. And they would place these statues in strategic places in their kingdom, in cities, in, in town centers, so that Anyone walking around in that city or that kingdom, when they saw those statues, they knew who was in charge, how powerful he was, how wise he was, and how majestic. And people would go and pay homage and bow down before these statues in honor of the king who created these statues in his image. But God has six billions, not statues, but beings, creations with his spirit, who have been created in his image. Anyone walking around the surface of the earth, when they see you, they see the King of Kings. The one who rules. You are a representation of the image of God that when people see you, they know who is king here. They know who is in charge. That means that you and I are of such value that we have this awesome responsibility and ability to represent and to mirror the one who rules. But you know, over time, people have turned away from God. They have lost their sense of value. And they begin to look for, they begin to look to other things to confer value on them. You have the question, how much are you worth? Usually the answer is monetary, right? Who say like, who is the richest man in the world right now? The, the guy of, um, of Amazon, right? He's like, I don't even know how much money, but it's like 60 something billion dollars. Maybe it's in that. And the second guy is not even close to that. And so we think that that guy is so awesome that because I have a hundred dollars and he has 60 billion, I must be like nothing compared to him, right? I must have no value. That's how our minds think. I have no value because I don't have so much money. I have no value because I don't live in that neighborhood. I have no value because I don't drive that kind of a car. I have no value because I have not gone to college. I have no value because I'm single. I have not been married. I have no value because I have no kids. I have no value because I have kids, but then they are crazy. I have no value because I'm divorced. I have no value because I'm married to this crazy one. I have no value. I have no, I have no value. And we are walking around everywhere trying to find something that can give us value, that can confer value on us. We're trying to buy clothes and, and buy this car and get this job and go to school and get that and marry that person and get these kids and do this so that I can have value. 
and get this kind of, maybe, maybe I want this kind of a body and, and, and I'm working so hard, but if I don't get it, I feel like I have no value. What do I have? Shame. Where God says that you are created in his image. You are of value. You don't have to look to something else or someone else to confer value on you. Look at what Jeremiah said in Jeremiah chapter 9 and verse 23 to 24. This is what the Lord says, Jeremiah 9. Let not the wise man boast of their wisdom or the strong man boast of their strength or the college student boast of their Instagram likes. That's in my Bible. <laughs> or the guys who live in the Northeast boast of their money. But let him who boasts boast about this that they have the understanding to know me. Remember we talked about that understanding, that spiritual understanding? That should be your boast, that I have the understanding to know God, to know me, that I am the Lord who exercises kindness, justice, and righteousness, righteousness on earth. For in this I delight, declares the Lord. What's your boast? Another question is, where do you get your value from? You see, when you are able to answer that question where you get your value from, then you will also be able to, to begin to deal with the question of, am I unashamed or am I living in shame? Because if your boast is not in knowing God and it's in something else, then I have bad news for you that you're living under shame. That the devil has you exactly where he wants you. But God is telling you this morning that I want you to change where your boast is. He says that chapter 1 of Genesis verse 26, let us make man in our, mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish and the sea. Some other versions say so that they may have dominion. When I think of dominion, I think of the word significance. Dominion is to be able to make a difference. Why am I here and is my life making a difference? Is my life having a positive impact? Am I leaving a positive dent on this earth? You know, Chris and Tanisha, you have like the most amazing privilege to leave a positive impact on little joy. That therein, God's given you that ability to have dominion in your family, to rule, to say this is how things are going to work in this family. That you have been given dominion, that you, you have the ability to rule and say, this is how I'm going to live my life and I'm going to impact my environment like this. I will leave a positive dent on earth. You know, you don't have to do big things to leave a positive dent on earth. The guy who led me to Christ, I was only 17, was my first ever basketball game in this season of basketball. You know, we've seen Sweet 16, you know, and uh, that was my first ever. I did not know how to bounce a basketball ball. And I was playing with these white kids who had just flown to Nairobi, I mean to my, my high school, from Portland, Oregon. So in the middle of trying to learn how to play basketball, this kid comes to me and he tells me, looks at me in the eye and says, God loves you. 
See, at that time I was oppressed by shame. I thought that everything was wrong with me. Look at the poverty. Look at the things which are going on in my life. And this kid comes, this white kid. He was so white. It was just like, wow, I've never seen that white. Like, could almost see through his veins. And he looks at me with the blue eyes, blonde hair. God loves you. And I'm like, wow. Because for me, you know, the only place I saw blue eyes were these dolls that we used to play with. And now there's this thing that's breathing. It was not a doll telling me that God loves you. Like, he hit me so hard. God loves you. That day, my life began to change. That day, I accepted Jesus as my personal savior. That day, I began to experience the journey of being unashamed because someone who understood their purpose came and looked at me in the eye and told me God loves you and they left a dent in my life. It has completely changed my life. The life of my whole family has changed. Most of the people in Africa have got to know Jesus because I used to travel most parts of Africa preaching this gospel, and now I'm preaching here in New Jersey because some kid who understood their, des- their purpose, they understood their value, decided that they are going to preach this gospel, and they had a dent in my life. Amen. What's your purpose? <laughs> Sometimes you don't have to do big things. You just have to let the uh, Big God, do little things through you. And when the big God does little things through you, they have big impact. That's what happened that day. Do you have dominion? That day that kid took dominion of the basketball court and said, I'm going to talk about Jesus. You are created to rule. So you not only are unique, but you have significance. Lastly, verse 28 of Genesis says this, God blessed them and said to them, be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Again, the rule, rule over the fish is here again. It's amazing how that has been stressed. When you see something in the Bible more than once, you know that God is stressing that. But what does it mean he blessed them? He says he gave them purpose. This is why you're here. You're here. Purpose answers the question why you're here. You're here to be fruitful. You're here to multiply people who have my image. You're here to bring the gospel of Jesus to situations so that the image of God might be seen. That's why you're here. That's your purpose. You see, shame will tell you that you have no purpose. Shame will tell you that, you know, you're a mistake. That there's really no reason why you're here. In fact, you're so worthless. You should take your life. There are kids living in this wealthy area of New Jersey who are committing suicide every day, right? Because they're being told that they have no purpose. That they have no reason to be here. That their lives are useless. God says that you're blessed to have an impact. Annabelle, you'll allow me to talk about you this morning. Annabelle is seated here. She is so precious and beautiful. Annabelle, she is a trained wall, rock wall climber. If you go to Gravity Vault on Route 17, 
you will find, you see, right now, you, you, you know, you see she red hair, and she has like well, on the most amazing, beautiful gap and everything. When you go to Gravity Vault, she's a beast. <laughs> I mean, you see those muscles and everything. She's going up doing all those crazy things. She's like, wow, that beautiful girl, that's uh, like, wow, she is dangerous. <laughs> so this sweetheart last week, she spent time with kids helping them to go up the rock wall. She was experiencing her purpose. She was giving back. She was helping others. With what God had given her and trained her, the skills that God has given her, she was using that. She said, my purpose is to help someone. She told me, Noel, I want to do this. And so to have someone like her who's discovered their purpose is absolutely incredible. What's your purpose? Do you know what your purpose is? Or are you just gaping from one place to another, groping from one place to another trying to find? Guess what? If you're in that place, you're not stuck. Because this is what God says. I'm going to leave us with this verse in Colossians chapter 1. In verse 13, you see, there was a, like me, I was under the dominion of shame. Growing up, shame dominated my life and the life of my family. Shame was the language that was spoken in my family every day. Look at how, how poor we are. Look at how messed up we are. Look at how... We are not like those other people and we can't make it in this life. Something is wrong with us. That, that was the language in my family, the narrative that was on the table every day. There was this dominion and oppression of darkness. I don't know what the narrative in your family table is. I don't know what the narrative that's going on in your heart is. I don't know what, what stories you tell yourself. Maybe there are those stories of I am wrong. I'm messed up. My marriage fell apart. I must be a really, really bad person. And maybe you could even just be in that place where you did some really bad things. It is true that you made mistakes. Colossians 1.13 says, for he, Jesus, Jesus came, put on a human suit, entered into my story in the basketball court. He came there, he was white, he had blue eyes, he was blonde hair, he flew from Portland, Oregon. He came right into the basketball court. And you know what he did? He, the Bible says, he rescued me from the dominion of shame, of darkness. And he brought me into the kingdom of the unashamed, the kingdom of love. This morning, Jesus says, I want to rescue you from the dominion of shame. I want to bring you into the kingdom of the unashamed, the kingdom of love. That's where I want to, to bring you. You are of value. You have significance. You have a purpose to live because you are uniquely created by God for this time, for such a time as this. And don't allow the world, Facebook, social media, or anything else to define who you are. Let the voice of God, the voice of the one who loves you, speak into the depths of your soul. Let the past remain in the past because we were rescued from the past. The past changed my perspective of who God is. The past told me that God's not good. The past told me that God doesn't care. 
Because if God cared, we would probably would not be poor. If God cared, I would not have gone to school without shoes. If God cared, how I would have been wearing all these dirty clothes. If God cared, why, why would we be laughed at by other kids? That's what the past says. The past changes your perspective of God. The past messes up with your perspective of God. But God comes and he tells you that he loves you. So today... I am inviting you to be in the company of the unashamed. You're beginning your journey to say, I will not allow shame to oppress me because the King of Kings has rescued me from the dominion of shame. Amen?